Welcome to the Discerning the Forums. I'm Nick, and I'm here with Dr. Roy Clauser. Welcome. Thank you very much. Glad to be and, here. And uh, yeah, so we're we're happy to have you again on our podcast. And uh, this time, I was really interested to get your take on individual eschatology or the final destination or final end of you know where where are we headed next um because i know that uh you have a very interesting view of th that i think could be controversial in the um in evangelical churches because of your take but um it's really you you've worked it out biblically and you've just come to the conclusion that you're right right <laughs> and uh and and you're pulling me along uh with you but i i have some hesitation but um i'll just say this that a lot of young people and i'll, I'll say this as someone who's worked with young people um are turned off by the uh, Christian doctrine or view of hell and eternal conscious torment. And I think there's a sense of um, that this can't, this can't be a biblically accurate view of God's justice, or it doesn't seem just to send someone, uh, you know, someone to hell for eternity. It, it might seem it might seem um, like we should do that for some people, maybe Hitler, maybe the worst kinds of people in the world or something we'd like to uh, punish for, for forever or that, or your neighbor that does that thing that annoys you. But um, for most people, if you think of your uh, family members who may, may not have accepted Jesus Christ yet, and you think, man, they're going to spend eternity in hell. It just seems pretty, uh, strange, I think, um, for a lot of people thinking about that doctrine seriously. Um, and, 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 uh, you would, you would sort of agree, right? I, th I think there, you're right. There are a lot of people who, if they're reading scripture and I take it, you're talking about young people who are inquiring or. Yeah. Maybe you're their minds and wouldn't yeah, are rethinking your faith. Yes you might be de deconstructing your faith or you might be a new yeah, right. someone new and not haven't right. encountered this before. Um, yeah. They intuitively find it at odds with the picture of God that's presented, especially in the new Testament, um, mm -hmm. but a loving and kind and forgiving God who's come incarnate in the world to rescue people. Um, then why would he, uh, why would he put them in it? hell forever they 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 have a kind of rough idea that that's those two things are incompatible that's not the tack i took in this chapter mm -hmm. first let me say why that chapter why that section's in the book um it's it's there because i think th that it's, it's a correction that needs to be made if we're to have a proper answer to what I regard as the best argument against belief in God. That argument is called the problem of evil. And the first thing you have to know about the problem of evil is that it doesn't mean what it seems to. Evil in that title is used in a very old fashioned way in English, where it means undeserved suffering. It doesn't mean why is there moral wrongdoing in the world or why are people okay. totally corrupt or anything like that. It means why is it that some people who seem to be as upright as we could ask for suffer horribly mm -hmm. while the mafia don lives in luxury selling drugs to kids? <laughs> um, it's it's a, the question why bad things happen to good people, but it's also why good things happen to bad people. It has yeah. to do with undeserved suffering. And that is a question that is not ignored in Scripture at all. The entire book right. of Job is about that issue and gives us an answer very different from the one that Protestant and Catholic churches have formulated. Now, the Orthodox mm -hmm. Church 
does it's not committed itself to that that doctrine. Okay. There's eternal punishment, um, and that's the reason eternal punishment is not, for example, in the Nicene Creed. It's in none of the early creeds of the church, because almost all of the early church fathers did not believe in it. They believed in punishment. There is judgment, and for some people there is punishment. But there is nothing in the New Testament that says it's forever. And that was the first thing to tackle uh, for that chapter. So what I did was to put together a chapter that did nothing but examine what the scripture says. That's all. It doesn't say, look, God is good. He wouldn't do a thing like this. Mm -hmm. It doesn't do that. It says, okay. what strictly speaking does the scripture say? have to say on this topic that's and that's i think that's important because we see a lot of um books coming out um recently i let i read well I, I think we can think of the most famous popular level book might might be like rob bell's love wins or something where there's a, uh, oftentimes an emotional appeal that people that who deny eternal conscious torment and maybe go for a more universal universal salvation approach there's a, an emotional appeal yeah. um based on you know, kind of how i brought brought it up where well god can't be this bad yeah. so uh I, so I, we got to fix there's, it there's a place and, and you don't take that approach yeah no you're just saying hey let's look at the scripture place, the place for that comes after you've examined all the scriptures and you see that they don't teach eternal punishment yeah. then then mm. is is the place for that emotional reaction which is mm. quite legitimate then um but i start with what the prophets had to say and then i go to what the new testament strictly speaking says and okay. and i also give an account of how the doctrine of eternal punishment got rolling mm. um, yeah, as i say it was not in any of the early creeds i think it's something like 13 of the 14 first church fathers all held that punishment was not eternal Mm -hmm. uh, and a great many after them. Now, I'm interested in that, but I, I won't pry that too hard because I want to hear the biblical case. Yeah. But I guess just to start with, um, what I hear you saying is that you're you're still um, claiming that you're you're embracing the historic Christian faith. Yeah. And you're not denying any major creeds of the faith. No. And in, and in fact, this this view can be held in line with with the 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 global church confession. Um, is yes, that correct? If we look at the early classic creeds, they don't contain anything about eternal punishment, and that's mm. because most of the people that were there formulating them didn't believe in it. Okay. So, okay. So the question is why that always comes as a big shock. Um, mm -hmm. because um, Protestant and Catholic, that is the Western Church, ha has held this uh, seemingly ever since, uh, well, about the 6th century or something. So how did it all get rolling, and where does that come from, and so on? Mm -hmm. so the first thing I'd, uh, I'd like to do is talk about two words, one in Hebrew and one in Greek which get translated as eternal. This is why mo so many Christians would be shocked that we're even talking about this. You look at Matthew. Matthew says, away into eat the fire that's never quenched. And it, talks yeah. e e and it translates it. Revelation. Eternal. 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 Satan is. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But the, the term that is translated eternal there very clearly is does not mean that. And there's no controversy about this. You can check any uh, any uh, lexicon or word study of the New Testament, and they'll all point out that the word ion, which is got what gets rendered as eternal, means an age. Now, the, it was common among the Jewish people that they regarded all history as the falling into ages. So there was the age of the patriarchs and the age of the prophets and so on. But, and this is how they speak, Jesus' disciples speak to him. Um, are you now going to establish the new age? They ask. And he says, it's not for you to know the times, 
so on. He puts them off. But that term doesn't mean then endless. Now, here's what helps generate the confusion. It does mean eternal and endless when it's used of God. When they talk about ion, uh, ions of ions, uh, ages of ages, it means God's everlastingness in his presence in time that's everlasting. Mm -hmm. God's also atemporal, a non-temporal in that he created time. The New Testament's clear about that. Right. But he has a presence in time that will never cease. And that never ceasing does apply when the, term, when the expression is used of God. Other than that, it never means that. And Interesting. If you any of these word, story, uh, word studies, I've, I've footnoted three or four of them that all agree that ion means an indefinite period of time, but not endless. Hmm. Well, the, the reason that this got subverted is the great influence of St. Augustine. Okay. Augustine was the Bishop of Hippo in North Africa. He died in the year 430. So this places his him, in, places him in time. Um, and he wrote very influential commentaries on scripture and very influential essays on Christian doctrine and so on. Many and of, of course, them. he was Latin speaking and yes. he didn't learn much Greek. Is that he Is that says, right? In his own autobiography, he tried to learn Greek and could never get the hang of it. Uh -huh. Now that doesn't mean he couldn't read a word. Oh, sure. But it does it does give us a hint that he did not read the Greek church fathers, the Cappadocians, who were a generation before him. The last Cappadocian died in 397, that's 33 years before Augustine. And the, those Cappadocian fathers are St. Basil, who was Bishop of Caesarea, his brother Gregory, Nazianzus, Gregory of Nyssa, and his brother-in-law Gregory Nazianzus, and his sister Macrina. Those mm -hmm. four put out a, a body of work roughly equivalent to Augustine's. Okay. <laughs> he, he was prolific. So that's a big deal. Yeah. yeah. And, mm -hmm. and um, of those... Uh, three of the four rejected the doctrine of eternal punishment and understood ion in its literal sense. Now, when the, when the 70 rabbis made the translation of the Old Testament into Greek for Jews that were not any longer acquainted with Hebrew, you know, the Jews of mm -hmm. the diaspora, the 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 migration of Jews into all parts of the ancient world. They translated it into the language, the business language of the day. And, the, and that's called the Septuagint translation. When they translated that, um, the Old Testament into Greek, they used ion for the Hebrew word olan. Mm. And they used it in the same sense. And it means an indefinite period of time, but not everlasting. And they used okay. it item after item after item that came to an end. They used it for mm. things that came had come to an end before they lived. So they clearly did not regard that term, either the Hebrew term or the Greek term, as meaning everlasting. It was a And that's thing. important because it's not yeah. just coming from a church father at that point. That's it's right. it's coming from the Jews that's right. Translating that's right. it for that's themselves. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So both the, the, the uh, rabbis who did the, the classic translation and the writers of the New Testament use ion the same way. And that is okay. an indefinite period of time. Hmm. Now, uh, there was also a rabbinical tradition that the period of punishment was a year. Okay. That did... <laughs> That is not ha that does not have universal acceptance, uh, even among Jews. But it's a it's a strong tradition. It tells you at any rate how the people who are trying to understand this came to see it when they compared it in the light of all the other scriptures they had. Okay. We think as Christians we have more scripture, we have more news, we have more revelation in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. But I will say right away that what I found when I reread the New Testament, is that it's absolutely consistent with what the prophets had said, what the Jewish prophets had 
said long ago. Okay. And that now, is, I find that interesting because yeah. we might see the New Testament is really sort of, uh, like you said, adding to or piggybacking off of the the Old Testament, but then sort of really bring, bringing in this this newer eschaton with Christ and it just really being this augmented thing, whereas before it was much more mystical. Um, so I'm interested in what you found here in the Old Testament first. Um, as, as regards to life after death and the future of people? Well, I find that the Old Testament does not have one view of that. <laughs> I, was, I was quite frank about this. Several views. So if, you're, if you're old and you want to leave <laughs> the results of a lifetime of study, you, you can't be worried about what this church and what that creed or what these people think already. You, you're going back back and look at this what does it say? Okay. And fortunately, along the way, I had the, the, the privilege of uh, getting a seminary degree, which required three years of Hebrew and three years of Greek. I, mm. I don't know of a seminary that does that uh, other than the one I went to, but they require it. <laughs> if you can't read Hebrew and Greek, you can go sell used cars. You are not getting a BD or an mm. MST, whatever they call it. Mm -hmm. So I, I reread this stuff and it, first of all, the majority view that's expressed in the old Testament is one that shocks Christians when they see it and they just, then they just sort of put it out of their minds. But it is that when we die, that's the end of us. There's nothing. Mm -hmm. When we die, it's just like animals dying. We're, we're gone. Yeah. So that reminds me of, the like the the view you hear about this of the view of the Sadducees versus the Pharisees at the time of yeah. Jesus, and the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection, whereas the Pharisees did. Right, and, they, and so the Sadducees are actually drawing from Old Testament passages, yes. and, and, and they're drawing the from Testament. what's the majority view. If you if you read Ecclesiastes and the Psalms and the, and and other places, it's filled with this. You die. They, 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 it's often phrased as a, as a question in a prayer. God, rescue me. I can't praise you from the grave. From the grave, no one honors you, and so on. It goes on like that. I would like to, to live in order to praise you for your great mercy, kindness, and that kind of thing. But it, it views death as the end. Mm -hmm. Or it leaves it as a question. Ecclesiastes seems to do this. Yeah, Ecclesiastes. Who knows mm -hmm. whether whether our spirit goes on living or just goes to the earth like the, the end of animals. So that's the majority view, and the Sadducees believe that. They didn't just re reject resurrection. They rejected life after death. Hmm. Okay, so then there's a, a second view that is expressed a few times, and I, I quote, I reference these, I document them. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the second view is that the wicked will perish and not be raised again, but the righteous will be raised to everlasting life. And that, that view occurs in a few of the prophets and it occurs in extra biblical writings. So for example, the books of the Maccabees, in one of them, okay. uh, there's a, a mother and her four sons are being tortured for mm remaining faithful Jews. And she says to the torturers, well, we will be raised at the last day by God and you will remain dead forever. And that's, that was the official Pharisee view. Hmm. Now there is a third view and, it, but it's only expressed in a couple of spots, Daniel 12, Isaiah, a few. Okay. And that is that everyone will be raised and everyone will be judged. And this this is the expression, the grounds on which they will be judged is they will be judged according to their works, whether they were good or evil. Now that too shocks a lot of Western Christians because we're used to hearing that the judgment is about whether you believed in God and Christ. And that's not what the prophets say and it's not what the New Testament writers say either. The New hmm. Testament writers repeat that phrase over and over, and so does Revelation, the book of Revelation. You will be judged 
on your works, whether they were good or evil. The judgment is moral. Hmm. God does not judge anyone for not believing in him when they can only believe in him if he gives them the grace to. So mm -hmm. to whom all the people he doesn't give the grace to believe in him and see that as the truth now, we'll see it when Christ returns. Okay. So how do you... I, but for now, yeah, he's not judging anybody for not believing because if they haven't, it's because they weren't among the elect to believe now. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So now there's passages, and I, I just just as I'm thinking about this, uh, I'm thinking about the book of Revelation where people are written in the book of life. Um, and is that still for you moral in any sense? or It, or it you has to do with a judgment in? that is moral. The, okay. the, the two relate to each other like this. If, you're, if you do believe in this life and your faith is in Christ, you get a pass at the judgment. So you, okay. if your name's written in that book, you don't get tried. You're, pro, you're given um, a proclamation of not guilty, hmm. and you bypass the judgment. So there, there certainly is an advantage to knowing Christ in this life, mm -hmm. um, especially okay. because you can confess sin and be forgiven for it. Okay? And it's... Whereas other people who don't are going to stand trial for the good and the evil that they did. Okay. And God says he'll reward the good as mm -hmm. well as punish evil. Okay. So I know so now here we're we're entering into kind of what the New Testament is yeah. is is interpreting here. How does it take those passages from the old testament and, and see the fulfillment? in Christ and how does that where, yeah. where does that go for you in the New Testament? Well, roughly what the, the prophets concluded was that there will be a judgment and God will judge the earth for its wickedness and then unite all people as his people and that the veil of death will pass away from all people. Hmm. Yeah. It's a, a very striking uh picture they paint. And the New Testament repeats that. There, everyone is going to be raised. Everyone is going to be judged. Jesus said that. Paul said that. So they, they aren't quite taking even the Pharisees' position. They're going further. All people going will beyond. Be I'm sorry? Going beyond. Yes. Yeah. I'm yeah. Just, yeah. It. yeah. All people will be raised and some will be condemned at that judgment. That is their a sentence will be passed on them and others will be rewarded for what they've done. This cross runs across whether, you, the, whether you're among those who believed in Christ or didn't. Christ himself said that. He said that at the time of the judgment, people were going to come and say to him, Lord, we did miracles in your name. We served you. And I will say, away from me, I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. Now, what mm -hmm. you have to do is think about, <laughs> I, I don't want to pick on contemporary examples, but there are examples of people who is, will tell you their commitment is to Christ. They're, they are in lifelong service to his church, and they do horrific things. Mm -hmm. There's no pass at the judgment for them. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. But what are they sentenced to? That's the mm -hmm. second question. Right. And, and what I find is that uh, I agree here with N.T. Wright, who has said, People continually misunderstand what the New Testament has to say on this because they take the metaphors that were used by the apostles, by Jesus himself, too literally. Hmm. So, for example, there's one in which Jesus says, oh, a wave into the fire of the age. It's not eternal, hmm. but it's the fire of the age. What's that mean? But then he himself says that fire is equivalent to salt. And salt preserves and purifies. In other words, the, the purpose of the of the what the sentences handed out of the judgment are not to wreak horrific torture on people, mm -hmm. but to purify them and make them fit for the kingdom of God. Interesting. Okay, so the, yeah. The sentences are blessings. 
Hmm. Given by merciful God to people who don't deserve them, and that's all of us, mm -hmm. so that they are made fit for that kingdom. Christ says that you are the salt of the earth. Salt is good, he said. So he equates fire with salt and then says salt is good. Right. And you think of, of the same thing Malachi says, everybody knows this uh, because Handel set it to music in the Messiah. Who is, he is like a refiner's fire. Mm -hmm. Well, what does a refiner's fire do? Does it does it punish the metal? No, no, it makes it pure. It it consumes the dross to use the the mm -hmm. prophet's words and and purifies the gold or silver and and makes it uh, what it should be. Okay, and that and that I find is the purpose of the judgment. So it has to do mm -hmm. with understanding the sentences handed out. They are handed out in love as bettering someone, not as torture. Mm, okay. And so torture, whatever they have. Yeah, yeah. The idea of torture, I'm not me add, comes mainly from Dante's famous Dante. of all this. Yeah. <laughs> Demons he, po pinching people's skin off with hot pokers. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah, yeah. He just, you know, no, no torture could be horrific enough. Um, but, but that's just not the way the New Testament approaches the, uh, the whole thing and, and it's not what it has to say now augustine made an argument he said look if ion doesn't mean eternal if it means an age when it talks about punishment then it can only mean the same thing when it talks about life eternal life you want it to mean eternal when it's appended to life don't you well if you do then you have to mean, have the same meaning when it's appended to punishment mm -hmm. and okay. the answer to that is no you don't it does mean an age when it talks about life. When it talks okay, about but then how would you know? The, but it talks about the life to come. It means mm -hmm. the life of the age to come. The age when the Messiah will return and the kingdom of God will be established on earth. That that age. Okay. But it it is said then that there are ages of ages of ages. You see, mm. there isn't just one age, but there's an unlimited succession of them. So, okay. Okay. So, and, and the other thing is that not all of the statements of the new Testament that affirm eternal life, do it with, by using ion. There are plenty of places that don't use that term and say that this age will never end. And so on. Oh, I see. Okay. So, so it doesn't, yeah, you don't it's need, it's not like that word's the only one we have. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And, mm -hmm. and it's just uh, Augustine's argument falls flat. If you look at those, all those other places, and I've, I've footnoted them in the chapter, you've gave, given mm -hmm. them to you, any number of them. I don't know that I got them all, but there are plenty that, that say okay. that, that it, a, a, we'll be part of his kingdom, which shall have no end. That's one that doesn't use I am. Mm. Okay. Okay, so the first so the, like they're getting specific there, but then when it's when so you're saying then when it when it speaks of um, the punishment that that is doled out to people who are sinful and are judged in the last day that 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 is for an age, but it doesn't indicate um, the eternal no it doesn't. everlasting qualifications right. that that the yeah. believers get sure. when they're discussed yeah. in the past following the judgment there will be an an age of punishment mm. okay maybe it's a year as the rabbis thought maybe it's <laughs> oh. a moment yeah a, a moment in which you mm. confront christ and you see all that he sacrificed for you and your remorse is so great that that's mm. all it takes mm -hmm. but at any rate well, okay. I don't think we should speculate too much, you know, go beyond what we're actually told. But yeah, that, yeah, right. But it, it doesn't mean torture, and it doesn't mean endless. And they're the two main yeah, things. Yeah, no. There's a judgment. Mm -hmm. and, and even if mm -hmm. it's not forever, it's well worth missing. Yeah, so if someone says, oh, Roy Clouser doesn't believe in hell anymore, that's not exactly what you're saying. You're saying that's right. that's you not. believe in the punishment, the judgment, it's proportional 
um, yeah. but you're denying the eternal conscious torment. Yeah, it doesn't take forever to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Especially yeah. If, if the punishment is, as Jesus himself said, um, mm. like a fire that purifies, it's, the fire is like salt. He says salt is good, and he goes on to describe its benefits. Okay. Yeah. So now, yeah. then... So, uh, there are people that object yeah. to this. I'm, mm -hmm. Maybe we ought to take this up. And get yeah, let's it. do it. Because there's a place in, in the Gospels where Jesus seems to speak of a sin that can't be forgiven. Mm. The yeah, the unforgivable uh, sin. The unforgivable yeah. sin. And, and um, it's in three of the four Gospels. And I compared the three accounts. And one of them is more complete than the others. Matthew's is, is the one that I think is the complete one. And in it, Jesus says that sin will not be forgiven in this age or the next. Hey. Oh, okay. So, But that doesn't mean it's never qualifying. Forgiven just in not in this age or the next okay i can see where that's a powerful argument because yeah be, because it seems to go right up against what you're saying yeah which is that there's no qualifying you know aspects to the the idea of age in its yeah. eternal sense okay yeah but since there are an endless number of ages that certainly doesn't mean it'll never be forgiven oh okay it's just this I, age or the next only matthew caught that uh, the other two accounts don't have that line that will not be forgiven in this age or the next and then and that's perfectly consistent with all the rest of what the new testament's presenting okay so you're saying that if if we take that to just be a finite number of ages even though it it's at least two um that this give you know taken with all the other passages doesn't really give us the picture of eternal of Dante's eternal. No, well, I don't know if it's Dante it anyway. Doesn't, but it doesn't yeah. give a picture of a sin that'll yeah. never be forgiven. Okay. Uh, yeah. Right. Just say, right. well, Blaspheming the spirit of the world. <laughs> it's just, that those two mm. can't can't both be true. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> it can't be that he he paid the punishment for all sin and it's forgiven in principle for everybody except there's one yeah <laughs> uh, except for one <laughs> no yeah. he doesn't say that mm. yeah okay. and, that, and another part of that story of the redemption of the world uh, mm. is the the people overlook is that it, that the new testament speaks clearly in that way it's it not only uh rescues people from their sinful and corrupt nature and transforms them, makes them fit for the kingdom of God where there will be no sin or death. But it's the it's the salvation of the cosmos. Yeah. Now I think that's going to be surprising for people because I think we often assume that the New Testament is just speaking of individual salvation, that it's really right. only concerned with getting human souls in into heaven but um and when i read this chapter you talked about as cosmic redemption the bible has this big scope and, and you're saying it includes even animal life but well yeah more than that creation yeah more that's, than that's the right. cosmos the universe the entire cosmos with all the galaxies and all the stars and whatever planets. which i guess would make sense in the in that God would have to restructure the laws for, for the universe to not just be winding down or going to a big freeze or you know, that's big where crunch or whatever. The evidence seems to be now, yeah, that that yeah. it will eventually uh, slow down and die, uh, absolute heat death. Everything will go to absolute zero, and nothing will happen. Well, maybe yeah. that's what would happen if there were no intervention. But right. we're assured there will be an intervention. In fact, what we're assured of is that the creation isn't yet finished. Okay. And that it will be. And I quoted um, a Benedictine monk who had a wonderful comment on this. If the creation isn't yet finished, then all our understanding of the other doctrines changes. He said, this doctrine has long stood outside the gates of theology Mooing like a plaintive cow, <laughs> cow wanting to be milked. 
<laughs> but no <laughs> one's taken it up. Uh, oh. and it was a wonderful quote. I, I, uh, <laughs> and and it, so what it means huh. is that Christ will not only uh, redeem individuals and redeem nations and peoples, every man, woman, and child that ever lived, Mm-hmm. But the entire cosmos will be completed. Finish now thy new creation, the hymn writes. Him, you mm-hmm. know, we have goes like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and that's repeated many times in the New Testament. So it's not something you can dismiss as a, an aberration. So okay, what I mean yeah. All the predictions about what's going to happen to the universe in so many million years and all mm-hmm. that. It's, it, it actually doesn't worry me. Um, yeah, you know, this is a joke. that's if all things go go right. as as they are. Yeah, that's right. The, the, there's a joke about that. Two astronomers are talking to one another, and the way, one says, "Wait a minute, wait a minute. What did you just say?" He said, "I just said the sun will burn out in 50 million years." And the other one says, "Oh whew, man, I thought you said five million. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to matter." Yeah, that's right. Well, but this matters in the sense that it seems that now this is what I think is fascinating when someone takes a minute to to take this in and just kind of try it on for size, this this perspective, um, it does it does in my mind seem to be consistent with who God is in his Trinitarian nature, his love and so forth. And I know theologians have made that argument, but seeing that biblically it, um, is, is I think really interesting. And I think probably the, the contribution that you've made in, in my opinion on this subject, um, are there any, have you had any pushback right away from, or critiques from on your work on, on this? Well, the, yes, I have from several sources um, been the subject of a plea to please take that section out of the book because the, it will prevent it from being published. So far, that's been true. Um, oh. it's, I'm still looking for a publisher. Um, but... I think for the for the entire apologetic that this book is, I mean, the title is Can We Know God is Real? So that's where, what we're aiming at here. And that's the only reason this comes up, is that this view of the final destiny of I all see. human beings gives you an answer to the problem of evil, or I, what I see as the proper reply to the problem of evil. I don't think that any of the theodicies that have been constructed uh, succeed. I don't think that uh, so long as you have the, the, the typical Protestant Catholic doctrine of God, that you can construct a, a, an argument that succeeds in answering the problem of evil. The problem of evil argument goes like this. If God's perfectly just, he wouldn't want people to suffer unjustly. If God's all powerful, he could prevent any unjust suffering. Therefore, if God's all powerful and all just, there will be no unjust suffering. But there is unjust suffering. Therefore, it's not true that there's a God who's all powerful and all just. Now, that's mm-hmm. a pretty valid argument. That means if all the premises are true, the conclusion is. So the typical reply on the part of people like Augustine, or in our own time, my friend Alvin Plantinga has given a, a expanded yeah of this uh, to argue that because people have free will there's an answer to why this happens and so i don't see okay i don't see those answers succeeding at all because for one reason even if people's free will meant that god has to allow the the possibility of sinning and therefore unjust undeserved punishment to occur in his creation God could always prevent the undeserved suffering from occurring, right? So somebody goes to the mall with a shotgun and aims it at people and fires but um, and pulls the trigger, but the gun doesn't go off. 
or they miss every shot. God can do that. If he can stop right. the mouths of lions from eating Daniel, he can stop all the other undeserved suffering from occurring no matter who does what evil thing. So yeah. if he doesn't do that, then he didn't do everything he could do to avoid the undeserved suffering. And you haven't answered the real point of the argument from of the problem of evil. What I say is, and this will not sit well with some readers, is I say that there is no answer to the question, why did God create a world in which he allowed evil in the sense of undeserved suffering? There is mm. no explanation given for why he did it. That he did do it is affirmed in no uncertain terms by the book of Job. Job suffers undeservedly. He says to God, why are you do this? It seems to me that you let the, let the righteous suffer, and at times you let the wicked prosper. And his friends have a fit. You can't say that. And when God yeah. appears the law, God says to his friends, you didn't tell the truth about me the way my servant Job did. You hear what he's saying about himself. Hmm. Now, what I did do was then say, neither is there an explanation for this. God has visited and redeemed his people and created a salvation for them which will be everlasting. There's no reason given for that either. Why did God decide to do that? Hmm. I don't know, but I'm glad he did. Hmm. There, neither one is given what we would call a reason. They're, they're both are expressions of the will of God for his creation. And we don't have an explanation. What we have been led to think because of the rationalistic temper of Western civilization is that there must be an answer. We just don't know it yet. So a lot of people like to say something like, well, we'll know the, all those answers when we get to heaven. I hope you notice that that is a promise notably absent from Scripture. Hmm. No such promise. So in your view, we can't answer the you're not going to try to answer why like you know why job's punished and he shouldn't be or it seems like he's tor right, you know right. tormented by satan yeah, over a bet right, you know right. he didn't deserve it yeah. <laughs> yeah right um and 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 you're saying there's just no answer to to that that we know I mean, god may know but we don't know um yeah, maybe so then pull that out. Yeah. But but saying it doesn't help much if we don't know. We still end up in the same spot. Yeah. We don't have right. an explanation. We don't have an explanation though for why God decided to be so why merciful. he and was merciful. He, yeah. So it's back both, the both ways. Yeah. from beginning to end and and bring them all together into his kingdom with the curse of death removed. And and uh, live as his servants in his kingdom forever. We don't have an explanation for that either. Yeah. So why did God make okay. the world this way? There's no answer to that. It's because right. he wanted to. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's it. Right. Yeah. But there's hope, and that's what. Yes. What you're you're pulling from your understanding yeah. the New Testament be saying here is. Yeah. But it's but see now, um, so what I think is is interesting about your perspective is you know as we talked about at the beginning you're not denying any major creeds you're not no, saying no, there isn't punishment I, there I'm god denying, isn't just i'm, yeah. I'm denying the ones that that express eternal punishment like new ones yeah you know, you're, more, you're saying yeah somewhat more yeah. recent I mean, the first one i know yeah. of uh to uh ensconce eternal punishment as one okay. of the doctrines of the faith um was um, uh, um, promulgated by the, the Council of uh, Constantinople in 553. And okay. they, they did that because the emperor sent a note and said he wanted eternal punishment decreed. And that's probably not the way to do theology. No. Okay, I understand. Uh, whatever yeah. the emperor wants. It's, it's what scripture says. <laughs> so um, I, I think it, it got into some of them rather late, but it got in uh, even then on a bad basis. Uh, okay. 
Yeah. It, now, some people object to this, the view, as I've expressed it so far, by saying, but belief is a condition of salvation, mm -hmm. is it not? You have to yeah. believe in God and Christ believe in, in the, his Christ. and in Christ and so on. And the answer mm -hmm. to that is yes. When Christ returns, all will believe. It'll be right mm -hmm. in front of their face. Every knee will bow, every tongue confess. That's, right. that's now, your interpretation. Yeah. That's a very important text, and I connect that with the one in First Corinthians where Paul says, don't make any mistake about this. No one confesses Christ as Lord except by the Holy Spirit. By the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And if everyone is going to confess, then everyone has been given the Holy Spirit. Hmm. And everyone is redeemed. Hmm. Those two verses yeah. together logically entail that everyone has mm -hmm. been given the Holy Spirit. Yeah, there's no getting away yeah. from it. And they, I've heard sometimes people yeah, qualify the all <laughs> to basically not mean all well, <laughs> in the universal well, sense. Or they might say all the elect or all of... Yeah, well, it's not what the yeah, text Whoever is. winds up in, in fact, Noah's in boat. In fact, in Revelation, it says every creature. Okay. Every yeah. creature in heaven and earth. That's everything mm -hmm. that's going to give God his due. And it gives that creational order of sky creatures, land creatures, sea creatures. Yeah. 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 Hmm. Interesting. Okay. So, so combining it together, age, age doesn't mean eternal always. And it doesn't mean either, either, unless it's used of God. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Unless it's used of God and there's qualifying language that makes it, that helps you know that that's a, that that's what it means in the text in the context yeah. in any passage um so this could be a bible test for a berean out there someone who's <laughs> <laughs> listening and they're like i don't believe you i'm well, going to go look up every passage the, and you have you have a book hopefully that will get published yeah yeah, yeah I give them all the references <laughs> well, these, yes I, I think this this gives the proper perspective on um evangelistic work and missionary work Okay, this is interesting because people off would object object to that. They would say, "No, why, why evangelize if they're all gonna be purged by fire and go to heaven? Hitler's gonna be in heaven along with with uh, all his the Jewish people he tortured." Because God has His chosen people among those who are living and those yet to be born to work for the coming of the kingdom of God. So you present the gospel, you preach the gospel, mm -hmm. and those who are elect will respond to the Holy Spirit, and they will believe. You don't persuade people to believe. You don't talk them into it. The Spirit has to remove the blindness of their hearts, and they see it as true. Mm -hmm. You know, they're getting, often in science, that's called self-evident. Self-evident, okay. so that the mm -hmm. gospel become it becomes self-evident to a person that the gospel is the truth about God from God, mm -hmm. and God redeems all in this life that He wants to work for the coming of His kingdom. And when Christ returns, then all will believe, and all will be made members of His kingdom. Mm -hmm. And that makes sense okay. in preaching because otherwise, ninety percent of it's a waste of time. You, 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 mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't succeed with a great many people. But then it's not up to you that it succeeds. You're to mm -hmm. preach. Yeah. So I've heard so people say, you know, if, yeah. yeah. I've heard people say if, if you believe in hell, that really motivates you to, to evangelize because you don't want your neighbor to go there. Now, what I'm hearing you say is you still believe in hell. <laughs> it's yes, just not punishment. eternal conscious torment. There's it's proportional it's punishment. Be yeah. avoided. It's just not forever. Yeah. But as right. I said, someone could. Yeah. It, it's the fact that it's not forever doesn't mean it's not well well worth missing. It is. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. So. Mm. Okay. So. Now this. So. Then, with the we talk about the age and and the age, is not necessarily eternal in each sense. And then there is final judgment. Um, those in Christ will, uh, mercy will be shown on them and they will not 
have basically they'll be forgiven all their sins so they don't have to pay for it in the same word afterlife that's right yeah yeah Yeah. so they're forgiven in the midst of the trial yeah and then that combined with this cosmic view of the whole universe being transformed right you're saying that's 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 building this this optimistic uh, future universal salvation view that you've kind of come come yeah. to the conclusion of. That's right. But and so that yeah. See, but we have it, uh, one text in the New Testament that says that Christ was made manifest to destroy the works of the devil. Now, either Christ succeeded or he didn't. <laughs> and if he did succeed, then it can't be that forever creations divided between those who have been lost and are still being punished forever and ever and those who are not lost if if his work succeeded in vanquishing the devil and all his works then it succeeded in vanquishing sin mm-hmm. yeah and, the, and so i think mm-hmm. i believe that christ's work succeeded <laughs> not, mm-hmm. not that he tried hard but the, the, the vast majority of people didn't make it anyhow <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So that those are some challenges. And I think that, so then going back and reading the new Testament, someone could keep this in the back of their mind, at least check, you know, say, Hey, is this really what the new Testament is saying? Um, one, if there, if I can ask you one thing, there's something I was always hung up with. And I actually, I think you do address it in the book, but in the book of revelation, I felt like there was a qualifying text in tw- in uh, twenty ten in Revelation chapter twenty verse ten. It says, "And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire." Well, I guess this would be a question I have for you about the devil and demons, but um, and if God will redeem them, I'm not sure. Right, Augustine used that. In that same essay with the, the yeah. for eternal punishment, he said, next you're going to tell me the devil and his all his minions <laughs> are also redeemed. Well, yeah, the book of Revelation answers that. Well, every, okay, so I, I just want to read this text out. Earth. Yeah. Every creature in, in heaven and earth. Okay. When the okay. and confess that Jesus is Lord. And no one can do that without the, the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. So then, a sermon Revelation twenty. Greg of Nyssa, by the way. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Gregory of Nyssa. Yeah. Yeah. So, in verse ten in chapter twenty, it says, "And the devil who had deceived them was thrown to the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were." Again, I know it's metaphorical here, but yes. um, and they will they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. But so the, is that a translation issue? Age. Yeah. Right? Oh, it go ahead. Forever and ever. Yeah, it doesn't say forever and ever. So that, that was the ESV. And um, so you're disagreeing with the, the translation there. For ages. Correct? For ages. That That's the forever and ever is the ant. But it's not qualifying. Is it ages of ages? Or or is that just the yes, interpreter's but, choice? But that, uh, but that we find that only means eternity for sure when it's used of God, but it's used of creatures everywhere else. It doesn't mean that. I mean, okay. I've given I've given a, a, a lot of the texts of Scripture that use that expression where it can't mm-hmm. possibly mean forever. Yeah, and, okay. and that's the grounds for saying it doesn't mean that here. Mm. Yeah, it's not that we're not making up what we want to see. It's right. What's there? Yeah. And when when the both the Septuagint and the New Testament use that expression for things that have already come to an end, then you know it doesn't mean forever in our sense okay. of never ending. Yeah. Okay. So then I, who how would you distinct how would you know then when the Bible's u- using that about God forever and ever that that is a qualifying factor whereas in that verse it's it's not but i have to look at i see i now i'm just now i can't even trust the translation i need a interlinear yeah reference I, here. i'm sorry about that 
But, um, <laughs> no, I, I mean, I'm oh. sorry about that. I'm, uh, there are spots in the New Testament where the translators of King James did not do us a favor. Uh, oh. They came to terms they didn't know, and they guessed. There are not a lot yeah. of them, and our salvation doesn't hang on them getting it, having gotten it right, but there are spots. Let me give you one that has nothing to do with this issue. In the, mm -hmm. the opening of the, of the book of Hebrews, it, it begins something like this. God, who in many times in different ways spoke to our ancestors by prophets, has in these last days spoken in his son. Now, let me tell you what the Greek says. God, who in many times in different ways began and continued to talk to our ancestors, has finished talking in his son. You think that's important? Yeah. Calvin cites it as the, the grounds for saying that the canon of the New Testament is closed. Mm -hmm. The New Testament had to have been written by one of Christ's disciples. That mm -hmm. was the criterion of the early church. Yeah. It has to be by one of his disciples. If, if, mm -hmm. No matter how helpful a book is, if it wasn't written by one of them, it doesn't count as in the canon of the New Testament. Mm-hmm. And, and here's one of the texts of the New Testament saying, God finished speaking for now, we could say, but he's finished speaking in his son. He'll resume speaking when his son returns. Okay. Through okay. His son. Okay. Yeah. But in the meanwhile, we have this text to rely on. This is the mm. message. This is the love letter God writes to humanity. And this mm -hmm. is what we have to work with. Yeah. And we have to be very careful about what it does say and doesn't say and mm -hmm. make fun for Dante or somebody else with it who has real writing <laughs> skill and a great imagination to run with mm -hmm. this. <clears throat> but it's not doing God's <laughs> people any service. Yeah, I see. I see. So now I, I went back and I actually pulled up my inner, inner linear on that text. And it's that that Aeonaston Aeonon at the end ages of the ages yeah. so i don't know if that even is like age forever and ever that's like no even that doesn't get ages that of the that doesn't the get ages, that it's just like yeah. that time of the time or something i don't know yeah you know? and it, and it means and even in the in the case of god it means that god has an established presence in time though he himself is non-temporal Oh, interesting. I mean, we, okay. have, we have any number of, of texts in the New Testament to say God created time. One of them is yeah. right in, in, the, in, the, in the opening of Hebrews. God has, he yep. speaks of Christ through whom God has created the ages of time. Mm. And that, I take it, that means yep. all the ages of time, not just yeah. some. Yeah. 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 So interesting. Time okay. is a created feature of, a, of the creation. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, well, thank you so much for this discussion. I think it was fun and interesting. I think for our, for our listeners too, um, you know, try it on for size, Look, read the new Testament and you know, read scripture and, and see what you think and, I mean, and really it, test it. It helps to read some of the word study uh, texts um, as well, because it, we can't, yeah, say carefully. to your, your listeners, go learn Greek and read the address right. for yourself. <laughs> yeah. That may not be a practical option. But yeah, use Bible Hub or something where you can see the the uh, Greek next to it or the Hebrew at least. You know, it's kind of fascinating. We have all these tools we can use today. Yeah, it is. Is we have a much better text of the New Testament today than when the King James translators did their work mm -hmm. they they produced yeah a literary mag masterpiece yeah it's beautiful it can yeah. hardly be surpassed uh or equaled mm -hmm. but it for accuracy in some places it it flunks it gets an f yeah yeah sorry <laughs> to say. yeah 
All right. Well, thank you so much. And it, it's, it was great to hear your, your perspective on this. Um, My pleasure. So we're, we'll post in the show notes where you can um, uh, look at more of Dr. Clauser's work. And did you want to make any further plugs or uh, <laughs> give your advertisements here? <laughs> well, right now I'm still trying to find a, a publisher for mm -hmm. We Know God is Real. And mm -hmm. it's a work of apologetics, mm -hmm. but it's a, quite a different one. Instead of trying to prove God exists or smash down unbelieving points of view with great yeah. uh, defeat uh, defeaters or yeah. arguments it doesn't do any yeah. of that it's it says okay. in the beginning that it's written for uh believers who would who are curious about the intellectual uh credentials of their faith and for people who are not believers but are willing to give it a try willing to look at it and see if there's more to it than just blind faith and i argue mm -hmm. that it's not blind faith at all it's it's uh, I, it is based on coming to see the scripture as the truth about God from God, but that's an experience that a person has. So mm -hmm. I suggest some things that may help that person to have that experience. So instead okay. of trying to beat somebody over the head, say you're wrong, or prove that this is right, I try to give the reader a way to find out for him or herself. Mm. And, okay. And yeah, that's a, and that's it. And then and then I go I do go on to compare belief in God to the best explanations of the world that atheist philosophy can now produce, and that's some form of materialism or dualism. And I show that the two compare very unfavorably with each other. The materialist and dualist view do not come across. Um, anywhere near the way belief in God does. Hmm. Yeah. And that, uh, I mean, they, by come across, they don't, aren't confirmed as self-evident. Self uh, what has gone unnoticed for a long time by most people who write on the subject is that when we experience something as self-evident, that's not the end of it. Whether hmm. that's an axiom, whether that's a memory, whether that's a present perception, sense perception, Mm -hmm. It's fallible. All, all people take them to be self-evident. Mm -hmm. uh, but what they don't re highlight is that after we experience something to be self-evidently true, if we acquire a belief in it, then we test that belief by further experience. I don't just mean more experiences of, of the same type that produced the belief that this is it's self-evident that the table is here or whatever. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I mean other experiences that confirm mm -hmm. that. And I look at what kinds of other experiences we normally use to confirm, not prove, confirm. It's, in other words, these other experiences are what you would expect if belief in God were true. And if we do mm -hmm. that side by side, belief in God and materialism, materialism comes out to flunk now, the, the grounds on which most materialists argue for their view is that it makes such great contributions to science and that you can't really do science properly without this. And what I show that it, is that its contribution to science is zero. Hmm. Nada. <laughs> Zilch. Hmm. Nothing. And, and the contribution of belief in God is rather great. Hmm. So... Uh, we have headbutting intuitions as to what's divine. Is it matter or God? And the answer is we can confirm the experience of self-evidence that it's God. And we can't confirm the experience that says it's matter. So matter mm. matters the blind faith. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds like a very good book. Very interesting. And so I'm hoping, I'm hoping, hoping it gets published. And I wish you, you were a publisher. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. Um, so um, they can check out um, the in the show notes. We'll have links to your your previously published books, and then we'll keep people posted if 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 you do 
catch a publisher and or if hey. you're listening and you're a publisher contact dr clauser and, and <laughs> thank uh, you <laughs> there yeah. is a, a website that has all of my published work on it okay. and a few and a few unpublished things um okay but also the works of a lot of other people who hold the same point of view it's called mm. all of life reformed no spaces all lowercase all of life reformed and you go to that website you can access all kinds of things that have been written from this point of view okay. and that's dot com or yeah. is it all of life redeemed um I, it's a dot com i think yeah well all right thank you we'll post that in the show notes for sure and um thank you for joining me on discerning forums pleasure yeah good to talk with you next